instance on terrorism, has basically been consistent. And so we've been consistent on terrorism for 10 years, and you're seeing the effect that we have basically uh, killed off the organization that did 9-11. That organization, that Al-Qaeda doesn't exist. There are some atomized parts of it that will pull off crazy things like the underwear bomber of the, or so forth, and they might get lucky. But the organization that did 9-11 doesn't exist anymore, and that was because you had continuity for 10 years it's also because uh, you have built over time an umbrella, an international umbrella of law enforcement and intelligence cooperation. There's a reason that when that package was on its way from Saudi Arabia through Germany to the United States, we were able to stop it. It's because of this great uh, blanket. So I think the terrorism story is really a quite good one. Um, I happen to think that the, the biggest thing that you have to do, and, you know, we can talk about what you do about Syria, what you do about Iraq, But I'm a great believer that you have to acknowledge that you can't lead from behind, that that's an oxymoron. And that the only thing that actually people dislike more than unilateral American leadership is no American leadership. Because somebody, some country is always setting the agenda. That's just the way the international system is. So what is that agenda? Well, first of all, it should speak to economic growth internationally. How do we speak to economic growth internationally? Well, it's not by sort of from the sidelines chirping at the Europeans about what they ought to do about the Eurozone. They're gonna to have to decide that based on their own politics. But a free trade agenda that actually might drive export growth for everybody would be a way to use international politics to strengthen the international The only, if you're worried about the rise of China, consider the following fact. By the way, the Chinese are not gonna, are not gonna challenge us militarily until we're all too old to care. Unless we do something really stupid, they will not challenge us militarily. But in the time that all that we did was to sign, was to ratify the South Korean agreement, the FTA, the Colombian FTA, and the Panamanian uh, FTA, the Chinese have signed 15 FTAs and are negotiating 20 more. We've been absent on the trade front, so reestablish the trade front. Secondly, energy. I have never seen anything warp, distort diplomacy like $147 per barrel oil in 2007. It empowered Vladimir Putin, it empowered Hugo Chavez, it empowered the Iranians. The United States has been given a gift. The North American energy platform, particularly if you think about the connection with Mexico and Canada, can make us self-sufficient in an incredibly short period of time. Yes, there are alternatives, and we all should be looking for alternatives, but we're not going to replace the United States, our dependence on hydrocarbons for a really, really long time. Because as I used to tell my European friends, windmills are great, the biggest problem for the United States is long haul trucking. You're not going to be able to do it with windmills or solar for that matter. And so get the energy piece right and the mix right. Third, always make sure that your friends know that they come first. Don't, don't send out a, a, reach out a hand of friendship to Hugo Chavez. He's going to bite it off. Don't embrace the Iranians. They're going to hit you in the head. When you walk into the room with the Iranians, have as big a stick by your side as you possibly can. In other words, make your friends trust you and your adversaries fear you. That's the nature of the international system. And then finally, never be afraid to speak up for our values. It is absolutely true that with Hosni Mubarak, you, could, you were trying to get him to change because you could kind of see what was coming in Egypt. You don't have the option of not dealing with the Egyptian government because it's authoritarian. You don't have the option of not dealing with the Saudis because they're authoritarians. But when a revolution breaks out in Iran or in Syria, 
two states that have done nothing but undermine American interests for decades, you can certainly find a voice to speak out uh, there and to try, to try to help. And so I tend to think of this more in ma as a matter of principles from which you lead, rather than how do I deal with this problem or that problem. And as I listen to the <coughs> election debate, the one question I never listen to the answer to is, what will you do about X? Because the person who says, on day one, I will. On day one, you won't. Right? On day one, you will go into the Oval Office, you will look around, and you will say, oh, I see. And then you won't be able to turn the ship of American foreign policy in one day. And so, um, you know, when I would advise candidates going all the way back to George W. Bush, I would say, you know, resist that moment when somebody says, what is the first thing you will do? Find my desk, right? <laughs> Call my friends on the phone. Uh, because, in fact, it takes a lot. So, now, I'm very respectful of the folks who succeeded us because it's harder in there than it is out here. Um, I can remember very well going to the front porch. You get the you know, newspaper, it's the Washington Post or whatever. You wrote, open up the editorial, says, the Bush administration should unite the world uh, behind tougher sanctions against Iran. You think, why didn't I think of that? You know? It's actually not so easy. And so uh, I, I tend to be pretty respectful of my successors, but I, I think if you, if you think about where we are, we need to refocus on 